Welcome to another episode of Southern Arizona's Nonprofits, the superheroes impacting our community. We're broadcasting live today on the Tucson Business Channel, a division of Mark Bishop Media, here at the Stewart Title Corporate Offices on Broadway in Tucson, Arizona. This show is brought to you by SCIP, S-S-C-I-P, the Social Services Contractor Indemnity Pool, ensuring nonprofits like ours for more than three and a half decades. It's not just another insurance company, it's a pool where nonprofits are members and have a say in how it's run. I'm Barbara McClure, Executive Director of Impact of Southern Arizona, host of this show, and with me today are two representatives from one nonprofit in town here in Tucson. It's called Teen Challenge, and this group helps people through drug addiction recovery. They endeavor to help people become mentally sound, emotionally balanced, socially adjusted, physically well, and spiritually alive. Please join me in welcoming two staff members here to talk about two of their great teen, ta- teen challenge programs here in Tucson. First, I have Patty Connor, public relations representative, and she is here to talk about the Springboard Home for Girls. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. You bet. And also with us, John Awada. He is public relations representative for Teen Challenges Men's Center in Tucson. How are you doing, Barbara? I'm great. Thank you for coming today. I know if you live in Tucson and you drive up and down Oracle Boulevard or Oracle Road, you see the Tucson Teen Challenge sign a lot. But I was surprised to find out how much history it has and how much you do. So, John, can you give us kind of a brief introduction to Teen Challenge and tell us how vast it is? Well, Teen Challenge is a global nonprofit, and we are uh, like a ministry program, if you will. Um, we're a discipleship program for men, women, and their children, and for, uh, for teens. Hence the name Teen Challenge, and that's where it started. Um, our program started in New York. There was a pastor from rural Pennsylvania named David Wilkerson who found he was just enraged about something that happened in New York, uh, where there was a number of teens that were on trial for an accidental homicide. And he rose to this occasion and left his church community and everything in rural Pennsylvania, drove into uh, Manhattan and literally advocated for these young men, um, young teens, really. They were kids. And um, what happened as a result of that is what started Teen Challenge. He in, ended up talking to the judge and getting some sort of court order or injunction together that was able to fund a program called Teen Challenge where there was a recreation center and they were able to have a place where the, he could introduce these kids to the to the gospel. And um, what resulted in that was the program called Teen Challenge and a number of those young adults or, or young children, their teens, in fact, they, they converted their lives over to, to the Lord. And... Um, not all of them, but most of them did. And they started this program called Teen Challenge um, out east. And by the time Arizona started, we have Teen Challenge of Arizona with five centers today. But we started a program here in Arizona. And it, Teen Challenge went all the way across the country in about seven years, 1965. Wow, that's fast. You know, fast uh, spread. It did. It spread in about seven years. And Teen Challenge of Arizona was born uh, in 1965. So the, the scope of our, our programs and our ministry is that, uh, Teen Challenge has probably close to 2000 centers across the world. In the United States, we have well over 275. Wow. That's a pretty good standing mm -hmm. across the States. It is, it is. And it's, um, and you know, it's interesting because Teen Challenge is a, is a ministry where we, we act locally, but we think globally. Sure. And so it's, it's really has a wonderful reputation and for saving lives and really restoring people with their with their family and most especially restoring men, women and children to the Lord. Uh, once we're re reconciled, once people get reconciled to God, uh, almost everything in their lives. And I'm, I'm a personal example of that. Everything in their lives follows suit and, get, and becomes restored. Sure. So. That's a that's a great way to help children isn't it? And, and adults is. as well. Mm -hmm. So you were saying that you're per, you have a personal story like that. Would you like to share that? Sure. I could share my story. Sure. I think people always find that interesting, personal stories. Sure. Well, 
I was a, well, growing up, I was a Navy brat. My father is in the Naval, United States Naval Services. He was in the Armed Forces and in the branch of the Navy. And he uh, had a career. He was a career officer. Um, we traveled all over the United States, me and my family. And every time I got established somewhere, I found myself, you know, when I found myself getting ingrained in the, in the community or being able to establish friends, it was time to pack up and go. Oh, and I so, bet. So I, not that I found it difficult. I'm, I'm actually pretty flexible. And, um, so what, what happened was that, um, I just found myself really not, I didn't really have much of an identity growing up. And so, um, I've had to integrate into different cultures every time I moved. We'd, uh, we, me and my family would move across the nation, and and every time I moved, it was t- there was a it was a big life change. I was having to go through a different school, and so getting involved with other kids, uh, it not only was it a strength for me, but it was also a, a sore spot as well. So when uh, I came moved to Minnesota, uh, my fam- my father had retired from the Navy. Uh, we joined the restaurant business that my family had been in. Yeah. Huh. I didn't, um, I had kind of a sheltered life growing up. But when I, we got involved in the family business, there was a lot of dysfunction there. Uh, the restaurant business is notorious, restaurant and bar business, notorious for, um, for alcohol and drug problems. And uh, sure. there was no stranger to my family. Everybody in my family had struggled in some way or another, at least each family that was involved in this. And I found myself following that way. I had more than one way to go, but I was encouraged to, you know, move into, into a cleaner lifestyle. But I found that other way with drugs and alcohol, I found it really attractive sure. at the time, being young and impressionable and without an identity. Um, and so I followed that way. I ended up becoming quite a big partier and established a really big reputation for being a, a good partier. <laughs> and so Uh-oh. I carried that image into college with me. Sure. I carried it into um, my adulthood. And, um, you know, and I, I did everything to the extreme. That was one of those things that I brought to the extreme with me. And uh, as a result of all that, um, I ended up being stuck with an addiction to cocaine for 41 years. Oh, gosh, that's and a long time to be addicted to cocaine. Yeah. Uh, my story it really began, I, I mean, it's, I smoked weed when I was in my early teens and, and I drank some alcohol when I was probably 15 or 16. But when I discovered cocaine at 18 years old, I, I was hooked. Sure. That's and speed. Yeah. It's, um, energy. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I thought I, I found my identity there. And, um, but about 20 years later, as I, I progressed through life and had marriages and, and I had a marriage and I had children and I, th- every time I had some sort of life change, I thought I was going to, that was going to stop me from, from this addiction. I thought it was going to be my saving grace. What happened was that uh, it just got worse. And uh, about 20 years into it, when I was probably close to 40 years old, I uh, ended up starting to smoke it. And Oh, scary. It was. And highly in addictive. In hindsight, it probably I, wasn't as much in the, at the time. Well, I knew, I mean, once I, once I started that, I knew it was going to be hard to stop. Um, I had enough, a difficult enough time with the straw. But with, uh, with the pipe, I couldn't. It was, I couldn't put it down. Yeah. And, uh, and um, you know, so my story ends with, I, I lost my relationship with my wife. I ended up uh, getting a divorce, lost houses, lost cars. I lost my family, lost everything really. Sure. Eventually. Um, and, you know, I did it to myself. I went through several treatments throughout this whole process about, and I, I after, after I started smoking crack, I was, um, I found myself breaking the law as well. And um, when I found, when I didn't have any money left to buy those drugs, I resorted to crimes in order to continue to support my habit. So they go hand in hand. It's, the story is very similar for other people. Sure. I would think you're and right. A similar combination or a very common combination. It, it, it really is. You know, when you become an um, addictive thinker, you also become a criminal thinker, I think, as well. So not... No, it is, no one's really exempt once they start crossing that path or crossing that threshold at some point. There's a point in, in which it becomes, um, it's not, it's not a, a, like a, you're no more experimenting. It's a, 
there's a point where it stops becoming fun and it becomes a necessity. And that's what happened to me. I never, nobody ever plans. I certainly didn't plan on becoming a drug addict, but eventually it happened and I wasn't able to put it away. And was, so. was it an example of where people didn't know that was the case? I mean, were you able to hide it or were you just... Oh, absolutely. I think there's so many, you know, I love this because, of course, if you have parents who are listening and sometimes parents are always the last to know or you think you're knowing everything that's going on with your children and then you're surprised. Yeah. I, um, well, I think the nature of drug, drug addiction and even alcoholism, um, it's shameful to some people, sure. especially when they're using too much, when they're going overboard, blackouts, things like that. They don't want people to know that sort of thing. So there's a lot of shame that comes with addiction. Mm-hmm. And I was no stranger to the shame. And so, um, and shame, the nature of it wants to hide itself. So uh, I was always trying to hide what I was doing. I didn't want anybody to know it. Even with my, when I was married, I wasn't able to allow my wife to get too close to me because if she did, she'd find out some things I didn't tell her. Sure. And, uh, and that is the nature of the beast. So, uh, so I spent a long time trying to hide it, even created my job. I was in the consumer packaged goods industry. Um, I was a corporate chef at one point, and I had a wonderful career. Uh, before that, I was in sales and uh, sales support and, and so forth. And as I was doing all these work in customer service and um, sales and culinary and, and in this industry, I found myself gravitating towards jobs that would um, allow me to travel more. Uh-huh. And as I traveled more, I was able to keep my addiction on the road rather than, than having it at home. And that's, so I was able to hide it That is for quite a while. And I think that's why it lasted so long is because um, I was able to keep it from my family. And eventually, I wasn't able to hide it anymore. I brought it on the back from the road and brought it home with me. And, and uh, well, the rest is history. You know, it's, once, once you're discovered, though, it's, and the cat's out of the bag, it's hard to, um, to do anything different. I had to do something about the problem. You know, sure. I was bringing it home with me. I was creating problems within my household. And so um, my, you know, if I wanted to stay married, I had to do something about it. So I went to treatment after treatment. And uh, eventually when the marriage ended, I, was, uh, I found myself in not only just more treatments, but I found myself in jail and prison. Sure. And, um, and, you know, it wasn't until I got to prison where I realized that enough is enough. I'm not passing on a good legacy to my family. And I, that was important to me. I didn't want to... Um, today I'm 60 years old. I didn't want to be in my 60s and still have this problem. Sure. Yes. And so I, um, I had an opportunity to see my grandson and realized that I'd only seen him for like probably twice in the last three years at that point. That was just a few years ago. And I literally thought to myself that this is unacceptable. I can't live like this. And so I did something about it. And the the result of that is is uh, other treatments, but when I, I finally really came to the end of myself, uh, it was Teen Challenge that helped me get through this. And uh, I'm so grateful. I've been to Teen Challenge twice, actually. I was there in Minnesota, and a couple of years later, I came here mm-hmm. and decided enough was enough. As Even, a participant, yeah, versus yep. as a staff member, exactly. Sure. I, I came here for uh, for restoration, which is a six month program. It's a refresher. Our, our program actually is a 13-month program. Gotcha. But I had to do the six-month program just to refresh myself. It just wasn't enough to make that full commitment. Once I committed to the recovery, once I committed to the Lord, once I made that commitment to invest in myself and, and desire for a new life, you know, something that was completely different than my old life and letting go of all that, all that stuff in the past. Um, when I was able to do that and surrender fully um i was able to make this change and i'll tell you what i'm not looking back god is very good he's been so good to me and and um he's restored everything in my family all my prayers get answered and uh they may not get answered when i want them to be answered but they get answered sure and that's a good thing and that's the important thing to know in your faith anyway isn't it yeah teen challenge was the atmosphere that provided the opportunity for me to truly embrace change and transformation that was really needed in my life in order to move in a direction that, um, that helped me to be productive and useful to my family, 
um, useful to myself. I can look at myself in the mirror now and say, hey, I like what I see. That's and great. That wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been, if I hadn't submitted to this program. And you had tried other programs because, you Absolutely. know, there's so many yes. programs out there and it's hard to find the right one if you're a parent or if you're an adult. Like you said, you know, 40 years, that's a very long time. It is. And I would, I would almost think even for parents who are struggling with children who have addictions or young adults and it feels like they're never going to get out. We have some clients that I often wonder, you know, what, what will be the final track that moves them over and moves them on a different pathway but sometimes it feels almost impossible so that's a great story to know there's a lot of hope yes there is so thank you thank you for letting me share that oh gosh thank you for sharing it with us it's so personal but i think it's good because people will realize they're not the only ones you know i think people like you say if it feels shameful and people are hiding it yeah and you know addiction hits every family it doesn't discriminate Um, yeah, there's, there's a place that can help and, and, and we're one of those places. There's other places, but I think ours is the best. There you go. Mm-hmm. Well, and spoken well, because it was so effective for you. Sure. Certainly I was. agree. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a great idea that, um, you know, there are addictions to all different kinds of things too, different, not just chemical addiction, but all kinds of things. So that's important to know too. It is. And it probably would be just as equally helpful. It, it is this program. Yeah. Sure. It, we, we help people with any life controlling addiction. There you go. Any, anything that has life controlling, um, you know, that, that has a stronghold on someone's life. Mm-hmm. The teen challenge is a place that can help with that. Well, and it sounds like it needs an updated name too, because it's not only teens, is it? No, it's not. Actually, yeah, there's, there's three different parts of teen challenge. Um, when I say three parts, there's teen challenge USA. There's okay. a group. So there's another group called Adult and Teen Challenge, and then there's Teen Challenge uh, International, and Teen Challenge International is what we are part of. Okay, I gotcha. believe I think that's what we are. I'm not 100 percent on that. So, well, that's that's good to know. When people can look you up, but I think the you know I always assumed it was only available to teens, so that is good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. And then, Patty, I know you're working with teen girls at Springboard, so maybe you can talk about that, and then we'll get back to the adult side of it, too, because it's so important. So many people could utilize this information. Absolutely. Um, Well, um, Springboard is the baby center. Um, It started in 1976, um, somewhere down in the central area of of Tucson, and then... um, the building I work in right now um, just um, happened 20 years ago in 2003. Um, the building was built specifically for Springboard Girls, and so they moved on over there. Um, Springboard started because our um, CEO, Snow Peabody, um, was working one day and noticed there, was t- there were teens ver- working on top, uh, living on the top of his building. And he started to talk to them and get to know them and thought, we need to do something about that. So um, anyways, um, long story short, he developed a program for those teens to get help, and, um, and then Springboard developed Just for Girls. Um, Springboard alone um, offers help for um, ages 12 to 17. And um, as John said, it's about life addictions in general, um, but with our young girls, um, not a lot, all of them come with actual drug addictions, and we're hoping that we catch them before it leads to that, but some do come with that. Um, a lot of our girls come with just life traumas in general. Um, some of them have been sex trafficked. Some of them um, self-harm. They have a self-image issue. Um, a lot of them can come to us um, Um, via juvenile hall, so we can be that second choice. So they come from all over the United States for all sorts of different reasons. And um, reference-wise, it's mainly the parents who call for help, but sometimes it's the grandma. Sometimes it's the actual um, person who has guardianship over them. And then sometimes it's the foster parents. It it just, you know, it it just goes in er in every direction as far as... um, um, the needs of these young girls in general. So um, when they come to our center, they stay anywhere between three to six months, depending on their progress. Oh, nice. And um, while they're there, um, it's a 
it's it's homey. It's I, I don't like calling it a facility, and it's definitely not medical. It's it's homey. It's springboard home for girls, and they have their own living room. They have their own beds. Um, we've housed up to ten girls all together, and they have their own um, you know way of living as far as laundry, kitchen, they do chores, they do cooking, they do arts and crafts, but they also, of course, get their healing. And so via the healing, they get um, um, what we they call class. So they go in there and they do um, workbooks, worksheets, um, different levels of um, knowledge that they learn from to gain the healing that they need via, um, of course, faith-based stuff, um, the Bible, but also um, through guidance counselors that are there, biblical guidance counselors. They do sessions with them. Um, they also have books assigned to them according to their needs. Um, there, there's just so many different ways they get this um, type of healing going for themselves. But we also work with the parents because it starts from home. And so the parents have parent workshops. They do family counseling um, via Zoom or in person, depending on um, where they live and depending on if they can come um, physically for this stuff. So we, the parents are very much involved. We do not just do... Um, um, all the healing with the kiddos. So the parents also get that knowledge of how to um, get coping skills and to understand their child a little better because, you know, they're frustrated and they're, they're emotionally involved. So um, they also get that kind of um, guidance counseling um, along with knowing their children all over again and in a whole other way, if that makes sense. Sure. And can they get to re restart, yes. reground or... Yeah. Yes. Um, so with the girls that are there, um, they not only just get school, um, they get um, schooling from Monday through Thursday. Um, they also, like I said, get activities. You know, they do arts and crafts. These are young girls and we want them to be young girls again. And they want to um, they want to know how to be young again because sometimes they have grown up too fast. Oh. So um, they come and they color and they, they do beadwork. They um, learn crocheting. Um, they watch um, movies on movie nights on Saturdays and they just, they have fun, but they also go to youth group. They also go to church. Um, they, they aren't just stuck in our center. <laughs> um, they go on hikes, they go to playgrounds. I mean, th they are our family up to six months. There you go. I was going to say so, but they're not going to the regular school. No, thank so, you for asking. Sure. They don't get the scholastic <laughs> learning um, from the schools and stuff as such. But, you know, if you think about it, whether they're straight A students or not, um, they're hurting. Sure. So um, for the most part, these girls come hurting um, and not concentrating on things. And some are truant or some get into the bad groups at schools anyways. So, you know, it, it's kind of what we call the natural consequences that come with that. So um, they do what they need to do with Springboard and they leave. But we don't we don't just shove them off. They leave with information for GEDs. They get um, counseling um, even outside of Springboard if the moms or the kiddos need to call their guidance counselor, they aren't just dropped off and gone. Um, we do follow-ups. We um, allow the, um, them to ask questions like if they're like 17 and just on the verge of being 18, you know, um, they learn how to do resumes. They learn how to do entrances um, for colleges and they learn um, just life skills in general to cope as um, being a future adult, you know. Sure. So, but we also um, we we also let them know that they are not only just loved, but not it doesn't end when they leave. If that makes sense. So there's always a connection for as long as they keep the connection for sure. So we between the GEDs or just getting back to school or summer school, night school, we give them all these skills even after they leave, so they don't feel so behind. That's great, yeah. and I could see where you'd almost have to take them out of school you so that you to. can immerse them in the program. Yeah, and, you do. And then catch Sorry, up later. But, yeah, some of them are happy about that, but then some are very worried about their schoolwork and getting into the next grade. So, um, but we are just more um, concerned with their well-being. 
in general. Sure, the holistic child, not just Absolutely. that scholastic education. Absolutely. And, you know, I always wondered um, when I was looking into this job for spring, Springboard and such, I thought, well, where could I help? So my own personal testimony is that um, I myself never been into drugs or drinking um, per se, f- you know, meat in general, but my ex-husband was an alcoholic. So I got the other side view of that, the effects of being on the other side of coping with someone who is um, into that kind of addiction. But I also was the one that was, you know, I was bullied, um, kind of grew up in an abusive childhood. So with all that that I've gone through, um, I am able to help these girls understand that, um, you know, there's healing after this. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. I, I want to take a quick break, and I know the audience is loving these personal stories and all this in depth information. So we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Today's program is brought to you by SKIP, the Social Service Contractors Indemnity Pool. SKIP is a member-owned, member-directed insurance provider with more than three decades of insuring Arizona social service organizations for their property, general and professional liability, and auto claim exposures. With an Arizona-based staff of claim underwriting and risk management professionals, SKIP specializes in providing personalized service, affordable premiums, and coverage which meets and often exceeds the state of Arizona's contract requirements for social service providers. For more information, visit our website at www.sscip.org or ask your insurance agent about protecting your organization with insurance coverage through Welcome SKIP. back. We're live in the Tucson studios here with Mark Bishop Media, and we're here with Teen Challenge, which we have just learned in the first part of the show is not only about teens, so if you're new and joining us, we're here with Patty Connor and John Awada with Teen Challenge and learning about what they do to help children but also adults tackle drug addiction and any life addiction, as John said earlier. We were just before the break talking with Patty about the opportunity girls have to live in a a very comforting home environment to help work through drug addiction, which is a very special thing. I was going to ask you about that program. Is it only here in Tucson, or is it also global? As far as Springboard goes, um, so we are the only um, faith-based, grace-based home for young girls here on the west coast side of the states our original uh, director that used to be here was um, just called to open up another um, home for young girls on the east coast i think it's um massachusetts and it's called bloom so really um we're the only um two that are faith-based, grace-based for young girls that are short-term um, care. We do have other um, centers in, in the United States for girls who might need a little extra more um, help, and it's a lot more long-term, like a year and a half, um, but that just depends on the families and where they want to send them, and it's 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 much more of a research thing and to stay a little long-term. And um, But we also have... Um, a, a home of hope in Casa Grande for women and children over 18, the ladies. Um, you don't necessarily have to have children, but um, it's to help the ladies um, get um, back into life in a more healthier way like the Teen Challenge Men's Center. But a lot of these ladies are also going through the program in order to keep their children and keep custody of them. Sure. So that's a whole other realm right there. So I love Teen Challenge because they think of everyone in every age group with every aspects of life that they're um, in need of. It is much more global, not just yeah. geographically, but in its service Absolutely. than I anticipated. Absolutely. And, uh, and, for, and for some reason, Springboard's just not heard of so much. Um, I was in the ministry work for almost 13 years with another ministry here in Tucson and never heard of Springboard. I have no idea why, but that's the truth. But then as I'm working there, I get it. We need to get the word out to um for people who need help, but also to get the support that we need. But because they're under age, we need to be discreet. So there's that really weird fine line of all that aspect of getting help, being known, and yet not known. Yes, it is kind of a challenge. And that's really why I love what this show does, is because there are so many nonprofits Mm -hmm. in 
Tucson and so many different addiction programs. And so for people who haven't thought of this type and with its success rate, what a wonderful opportunity to share this. So again, thank you both for coming. And then John, maybe you can share with us a little bit about the men's the men's program that you are involved with. Um, yes, I would be happy to share some information about that. Um, well, we're first of all, I'm going to mention that we're, there's three centers in, in Arizona for men. We've okay. got the uh, Tucson Men's Center, the Phoenix Men's Center, and those are both what we call induction centers. That's where the person would come in and spend the first four months of their program. Our program for most of the people that come in, that become involved in this is a 13-month program, so it's it's an investment that is, of time. Mm-hmm. Not so much money, but time. Um, and then the, the next phase of the program, either whether they're in Phoenix or Tucson, uh, we'll spend, they'll spend seven months. The, the person will spend seven months in uh, the Phoenix. It's north of Phoenix. It's New River at the Christian Life Ranch. Okay, I've the heard Christian of that. Life Ranch is, is the second phase of our program, and it's called transition phase. Our first phase is induction. The second phase is transition. The per- people that go to the ranch will spend seven months doing most, most of the time they're, they're involved in work therapy. They'll be doing what's called the work experience, and they... Um, immerse themselves in work. Um, some of the stuff is really stable. Some of it's, um, they're working with companies that align themselves with Teen Challenge. And okay. what they will do is they'll, they'll work in various jobs and they'll find themselves volunteering their services in places that maybe they wouldn't have done before. But the benefit of that is that we're helping the community. And so all the jobs that people, not only are the men getting um, job skills they're they're also developing social skills in the process and they're also developing a attitude of volunteerism and um, they want to be a benefit to society and sure. that's the change that's what makes what's causes a lot of the change so a lot of their uh, time is is spent in the work program mm-hmm. but there's also the same type of discipling that we do we have a uh, we have a very rigid coursework that starts in the induction phase. So at Tucson, in the first four months, what happens is that uh, the men will wake up in the morning at the same time every day. Our wake-up call is at 6 o'clock. Wow, early. Okay, yeah, that's th- five, six, six days a week. Sure. Sunday through th- through Friday. Th- Sunday through, yeah, Friday. They wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Breakfast will be at 6.30. Or um, we do devotions at 6.30, and at 7 o'clock is breakfast. And so the schedule is the same every day. There'll be classes that follow that, praise and worship. So they'll be listening to music and basically meditating on the Word of God uh, throughout that time. Uh, the classwork comes afterwards. We have lectures. We have visiting preachers and pastors that come in and teach classes. We also have counselors that come in, and most of our counselors are voluntary. But we also have other counselors as well. And we also, all the people that work in the program, like myself, are um, have participated in the program. So... We know what they're going through. We know um, how they're feeling. Sure. And, we, and we've been through it. So uh, we also advise them. We don't, we're not considered counselors, but we're considered advisors. And each one of us has at least one or two men to advise. I've got two right now. And I could see where you'd be great advisors having been through those experiences. Yes. And then I think the people who are participating would really feel so much more connected mm-hmm. to the program and to someone. So Absolutely. that's a great benefit. Sure. During this program, the, uh, the men will get assignments. They have two units in the induction phase, mm-hmm. and they learn about the Bible. They learn about, um, they learn scripture, things that they can stand on. Um, uh, the men will also learn about uh, different character qualities, like responsibility, honesty, integrity. And there's a whole list of 40 of them. Sure. So... Uh, then what they do is they also um, they study on it and they apply those character qualities in their life. We try to encourage them. Like I mean, you read our, our mission statement about yes. being socially adjusted, mm-hmm. physically well, mentally balanced, or emotionally balanced, and, uh, and so forth, and spiritually alive through Jesus. Uh, those are all different areas. They're the, the whole person. And we try to get their whole person involved, you know, involved in the program so they, they have things that are going to feed their spirit, things that will feed them emotionally, things that will feed them physical. We've got a weight room, so there's a lot of people that participate in exercise and 
and that continues at the ranch. There's a lot of weightlifting and bonding with other men at the, at the place. Oh, I could um, see how that would be sure. very helpful too. It is very helpful. And, and you know, it's, um, I, I told you before I had been to a lot of treatments myself. Mm-hmm. I've never connected with anybody in treatments that were secular. I don't know what it is. Sure. But I have friends. All my friends are from Teen Challenge. That is interesting. So it's, we encourage friendships. I can that, almost see yeah, you know, it. I could it, see how it would develop that way. It does. We get very close to each other. And, and Patty mentioned about being a grace-based program. Arizona is one of the few, if not the only, mm-hmm. grace-based program uh, that Teen Challenge has. A lot of them are motivational programs, so they're based on rewards and punishments. Ours is based on grace. The, the men don't really get in trouble for anything. There's about three things that can get them out of the program. Sure. You know, and, and stealing would be one of them. Um, fighting would be another, and drug use. Uh, other than that, uh, we extend grace to them, and we have them evaluate. And our evaluation process is almost every day of the week. We do it at least four days a week where we sit down, and we get in front of our peers, and we basically have a form to follow. One's a before and one's after. So the after would be something that if, if I had done something wrong, sure. I can actually get in front of my peers and explain why I did it. And... Um, what it, what what was the thing that happened? What you know? What caused this? And and then what is what am I trying to learn from this experience? Is how it finally the question that gets answered at the end walks you through a number of questions so that we can ask the person questions. And it's never about uh, what they did. It's never being about, good or bad. It's, it's, it's just, never about I got angry yeah. at the, my my roommate. Right. It's never about that, or I didn't make my bed, or I didn't shave in the morning. It's never about those those issues. It's about what the root cause of it was. It's about what, um, how, how I was, how I received love in the, in my, in my childhood. It, and it gets that deep. So we ask questions that, uh, that pertain to their character. Sure. And so eventually that's what happens is that, and that I think that's what, what causes change in the individual. I personally did 12, uh, in the six months that I was in the program. In fact, in about the first five months, I did 12 evaluations, one at least every other week. Sure. And, and I did it because I needed to expose some things. I needed to be vulnerable and transparent and let people know who I am so they could love on me the way I, I needed because I wasn't getting any better um, trying to keep secrets. And, I, was, I was thinking that in the beginning when you're talking about it, the sense of shame mm-hmm. as an addict and thinking, and then you go from this, that sense of, in that place of shame and feeling poorly about yourself and then when you come to a place that's full of grace how you can't help with especially that kind of support yeah exactly and people reassuring you or you know confirming that you are a worthwhile person and then just to bring you back up out of that would be so yes meaningful Uh, it's it really is powerful really it is and not only that but we also partner with churches too sure we get involved in their community whether it's through work or whether it's just going to their men's breakfast on a, on a first Saturday of every month, um, as well as going to church twice a week. When we partner with these church communities, they become supporters of us as well. So, sure. You know, we also have a sponsorship program, too. So Yeah, I was going to ask you about volunteers. So mm-hmm. would one of you like to address that? Sponsors? Sure. Um, yeah, um, the men's center has one too, as well as springboard. And so there's someone assigned for that specific area. So, um, if someone wants to, um, you know, we're nonprofit, but it still costs (laughs) to have, um, our center open just overall in general with all that included. So the sponsors go out and, um, would love to bring in people for tours and stuff, but what they need is for someone to, I guess you can say, adopt a student at our center to give money towards their, their program. Um, but you can also just give, and then, um, we just use it where it's needed, if that makes sense. So you can either, um, sponsor someone specifically or just be a sponsor monthly and it goes to who needs, um, the, the help to be at any of our centers really. Um, as far as volunteers, well, you open that door. So um, with Springboard alone, um, and of course we have to be very careful because we have underage girls, but um, with the activities that they do um, on the weekends and such, we also um, welcome people to come during the week when there's time to do game nights. 
um, they come and do their own personal chapels on Friday nights. And um, I've done a few myself, and that's where you go and you either share your testimony with the girls and they see how transparent you are, like John was talking about, and know that we're not above anything. We, we, we are all going through something, and we can all either relate with somebody or at least understand how we're not perfect. And um, the only way we got to where we are now is through our faith um, with God, of course, and allowing him to heal us. So it's not in our power but his that we get better. And um, we would be that proof for the young people to know or the adults to know that there's hope to get to this end of the um, so-called tunnel. So um, that's where the chapels come in on Friday evenings here at Springboard anyways. Um, we have ladies come in and do arts and crafts. We have ladies come in and do cooking classes with our girls. It just depends. And it's funny because I'm the person that does all the scheduling for Springboard mostly in general. So I schedule all those volunteers. I schedule the girls' activities. Um, I want to add in the fact that we also teach our girls to give back. And um, they're not as free to go out and about like the like the um, adult centers, but what they do um, is maybe go to. Um, they used to go to Caring Ministries and help um, do food boxes. Sure. Um, they would go to churches and um, do certain things, whatever they're asked of. Right now, they ch- um, clean a specific church that they go to church at on Sundays. And then um, I've got to put a plug in for the fact that we have a boutique, and it's called Blessing Dale's Boutique. It's on Ina and Thornydale. And um, all proceeds in that boutique go towards our young girls' um, sponsorship programs. So every penny goes that way just for the girls specifically. And so there's um, there's Saturdays where the girls go and help clean up the boutique before they open. So they give back. Sure. They give back. And they're actually happy to. They they love feeling um, like they're trusted with responsibilities, you know. And so um, to just get out and about is like a field trip anyways. I mean, we have a lot of fun. And we have volunteers that actually um, are the more... Um, constant ones and they go and go swimming at their house um, on Saturdays so these girls are young and they get to play Um, so with the volunteer opportunities call me I will get you in there I will give you free tours Um, we do fundraising a lot, especially as our um, PR people. Sure. Um, and so I know John will talk about some of the stuff that we're having coming up, but I specifically want to specify the 20th of September next month is our 20th anniversary in our actual n- newer building um, of Springboard. Oh, so, congratulations. Yes. Yeah, so we're having an open house from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, if you get on our website, you can um, see all our events, our newsletters, anything you need to know about Springboard. But we also, our largest fundraiser is November 6th, which is our fall banquet, and that's at the El Conquistador. So um, all that information can be found on site, um, on our websites and stuff, because I know we can talk all day about what we want you to be a part of. So, so our major fundraisers are our fall banquets, and then I just started one um, with Springboard. Board and in May, this past May, our very first spring gala ever. So oh, we're fun. we're trying to continue that um, um, and do our spring banquets or spring galas for Springboard specifically, and then our fall banquets for our um, men and Springboard centers. So volunteer opportunities, yes. Um, if you can't physically help, we have our sponsorship programs. We have our monthly giving. Um, everything can be found on either one of our websites for that. And are you by any chance a tax credit, Arizona yes, tax credit we, qualified? Yes, we have a tax okay. exemption, absolutely. And we can give you all the tax ID and information that you need if you get a hold of us. Sounds good. Yes. Lots That's of ways right. to get involved. Absolutely. That's and, right. And for such a good cause. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, the tax credit just went up, in fact. Mm. so Very nice. Yeah, it just went up. It's I don't know how much, but it's... It continues to be a really great benefit here in the state. It is great that the legislators continue to revisit it and make it even more generous for the community. I think so too. It's um, it's it's something that I think everyone should take advantage. Why 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 give it to someone? Well, I know the government needs it, but at the same time, there's nonprofits that could really use the support. I know we could use it. We've got people that are in our program that can't afford to be in the program, but we put we. We don't turn anybody away for lack of funds. We just won't. That's so important. And, uh, that's that's. I think that's secu- that's um, 
that's biblical right there. Yes. And so we, we won't turn anybody away for lack of funds. Yes. But we do, um, you know, in most cases, we'll have a, a, a small fee for if to, for the intake fee, and then we have a um, an application fee as well, but it's very minimal. Sure. When, when you look at what's mm-hmm. what else is out there. So I can't leave this interview without talking about what our success rate is. Yes, I would love yes. to hear our, the, our a story. Or mm-hmm. it is currently at 80% yes. for the people that finish our program. That's amazing. And, so it's, and that's a really good... Um, uh, not everybody can finish the program because they're not... They don't want to invest the time. Sure. Um, but I think we've got a high percentage. I don't know what exactly that percentage is of people that do finish. And, um, you know, it's, I've been to a lot of programs, like I had mentioned, and there is no better program. If you want to get help that you need and, and you want to arrest it and live a, a more productive and very abundant and satisfying life, this is the place for you. Teen Challenge. I'm, I'm, it's, um, it saved many lives, mine being one of them. It makes sense so, because, as you were saying before, you're not just changing behavior. I mean, you're changing an entire mindset. It is. So when you're, you leave the program, you're a different person. You're right. And you're it's right. not like saying, well, I've learned some new habits. Right. And when I go out of the program, those old habits return. Or if you go back to the same friends and the sure. same place you were from and you end up back in the same. And that happens. That sure. does happen. But it's... Um, I think we, we train people to think differently. Mm-hmm. When when your thinking changes, your behavior changes, and so it's um in some in some cases that's we've got to get as deep as beliefs, and change oh. their beliefs. Sure. And so, and I think naturally a person does change their beliefs when they get really hit with the spirit of God, and they r- really see something. It's you know the Bible we we consider the Bible as a mirror. It's like looking in the mirror, so it'll tell you things that about yourself that you really don't know or maybe you knew but you didn't want to have to take a look at but this sure. is what it forces you to do yeah. so and it's um it's a great way to apply knowledge so yeah. let me just tell you about some of the events we have if i'm sure might. we'd love to hear but um i also um before i go any further i just want to say that like 35 percent of the men that go through our program end up in full-time ministry when they're done with the program oh that's interesting so if that's something that i mean it's i think it's an interesting statistic because when you talk about changing somebody's mindset and their thinking and their belief system, that's really what happens. So 35% of those people decide that a new direction needs to be taken in their life in order to continue that success that they're, they've achieved. And success isn't really net measured in monetary no. things, but it's measured in, uh, in being productive, being useful, being yeah. uh, honoring, uh, you know, honoring uh, others around you and being a giver. Those are things that I consider to be good qualities. Sure. You know, not just being free. Right. That's a big deal is to feel, to have that sense of freedom that comes from knowing who you are Mm -hmm. in the Lord. But it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, living in a way that is not only productive, but also useful towards others. I want to piggyback on that with our young girls. Mm -hmm. Um, um, like I said, I was bullied and I lived an abusive life. So your your sense of worth is really, if if not gone, small, small, small. very small. Sure. And when you're when you're used to being treated a certain way and told a certain way, um, it's instilled in you regardless. So especially with the young girls, it's beyond even just the self image of how you look. It's how you feel in your heart. So um, when you change that in them and you let them know their worth in God and the way God's sees them, not how the world sees them. And definitely learn to forgive yourself if need and the way you need to see yourself as well. And so um, a lot of our girls go into mission work or want to. Sure. Or even want to be teachers. And it's it's beautiful because you see these girls who think they can't do anything. And they're like, I think I want to be a teacher. You know what? I think I want to do something that helps young girls when I get older because of this. And, you know, you just... You just love it. And this year alone, this past May, um, we have graduations twice a year, and we celebrate them for um, finishing up the programs. We personally had our very first 12-year-old graduate. Oh, my goodness. And that means a lot. It means a lot to us. It really does. You see these babies coming in, and you're just like, oh. So, um, So to be productive citizens in this world, yes, 
great. But to actually have that confidence and self-worth that they never had before um, because of the love that not only do we show um, the people in our programs, but it comes through God. And, and it's hard to love sometimes, especially when you're working with a lot of teen girls, but you know, um, the, all the, these challenges, yes. life is full of but challenges. But you know what, right now we're, we're, we're the parents for them at that moment. Sure. And the parents trust us with that. So, um, we get our strength, our energy, our knowledge and our grace, um, from God in order to show that for the girls and to show them that you can get through this. That is very cool. Yes. It's just so important. I think that's exactly it. It's what you have to feel that inside mm-hmm. to ever change. Yeah. And that, I think that's so poignant. Mm-hmm. So thank you for sharing yeah, that. Yeah, that you have a future. You really that's right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought I'd be in ministry. I, I never, bet. I bet. I, I never in a million years thought that this is what I'd be doing. Sure. But um, it's so natural, isn't it? It's Once not you're even, there. not even a job anymore. Right. Exactly. I, I do this because this is where I'm supposed to be. Sure. And so I, I just... Um, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just that I sense it. it's part of who you are. It, it is an extension of, of myself. It's your sure. heart. And it's, um, you know, and I've always enjoyed helping people. Mm-hmm. I've always enjoyed, that's why I, being a server in a restaurant and being a bartender, uh, being a, a restaurant manager, that, sure. that fit me. But it wasn't the right Ironically. business. Ironically. It was not the right <laughs> business for me. Yeah. I was using my skills and my talents and my gifts in an area that I probably shouldn't have been in. Mm-hmm. It was destructive for me to be in that business. And, uh, so now I'm in a business where I can do the similar stuff. I can serve people. I can, um, I can, I, I have a gift of hospitality and I use it. Oh, sure. I in, bet. My, in my job here. But it's, um, but God is using even my failures. This is the wonderful part of it. It's He's taken testimony. all my shortcomings and all my failures and turned them around. So not only have I been able to increase my, all the, already, all those good gifts I already had. But I'm also able to take the ones that I, that were never strengths for me at all. Sure, they are weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Exactly. And so, and, and that's they what help people. And that's what, what you know. That's what we do. We we, you know, it's um, Second Corinthians, and the, and the, it, it talks about how the God of all comfort comforts us in all our afflictions, and so that we're able to comfort others with the same comfort He gave us. There you go. And sure. so, and I stand on that. That's the, what I what I'm able to do. That's my ministry. I can now comfort others and be maybe a, a guiding light to somebody who doesn't know um, how to how to do that. But now I can comfort somebody else with the same comfort he's given me, and so I can share my identity with them, let them know that they are also a child of the Most High, and they can run with that. Yeah. And so you know, and I think even men, mm-hmm. women too, mm-hmm. but even men need to know that they're loved. Sure. They're, they're, um, maybe more so because there's an, yeah, I, I don't mean ego in a negative way, but there's an expectation that they're going to be strong right. and independent and, and Patty is nodding and saying, yes, yes. And mm-hmm. you're, you're is, is that right. your experience? No, too? it's true. I mean, it, it's okay to be the head of the household and be strong and, and be our warriors and all this stuff, but it's also good to show your heart. Yeah. That can be what we call, as Christians say, we get broken mm-hmm. and we fall on our knees and we show our vulnerabil- vulnerability and that's actually okay. And um, sometimes when when um, I have ladies come and talk to the girls, um, when they gain their trust, I also bring in their husbands because these girls need to know there's good men out there. There is there's, there is a future um, with good Christian men you know, they're not all bad. And, sure. and um, so there, it, there's a sense of trust that you got to help them learn um, through only God's knowledge and strength. Um, and um, to know that if you trust him, he will not fail you. Sure. And I think it's just that coming together of like-minded mm-hmm. people and like-minded yes. spirits. And there's a promise of marriage and children and just just all that loveliness because if I didn't lean on my faith um between the abusive life I had and then the abusive marriage I had I would be a very lonely person right now and I'm a pretty positive person and it it, it was in and people are like you've been through stuff you feel and it's not because I'm perfect but they see the joy that I have that um through my healing that I have allowed to 
happen. So yes, I'm happy and not always, but you know, you find the joy in the darkness meaning it's hard to explain that, but you, you still try to grow up for things you're thankful for and that in, and things could be worse. It doesn't negate how you're feeling and it doesn't negate what you're going through, but it's still a promise of hope that things are going to get better and there are things you can still look at that's still good, regardless of what you're going through. So when, when you talk to these girls or when I do, they're like, gosh, Miss Patty, we would have never guessed you'd gone through all that. You're always so smiley. But it's like, but that's the joy of the Lord. That's his strength. That's his healing. It's not of me. I would have been crying in a corner all my life, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty passive. Essentially could have been, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't get into drugs or drinking, but my weakness was passiveness and, and meekness and just kind of just withdrawn and not enjoying life for a little bit. So, you know, you got to, all of us need to get healed from something, so. I think that's very true. Like mm-hmm. you said earlier, John, it's the vulnerability mm-hmm. and the things about yourself that you need to just mm-hmm. let out there and move on. Yes. The, um, I was going to ask you, because we talked about girls and we talked about adult men, mm-hmm. is there, and as we come to the top of the show or the bottom of the show, mm-hmm. is there a program that is there for young boys or are all the men have to be 18 and older and the men, I know the men's no. program. Well, in Arizona, we don't have a boys center anymore, okay. but there are eight adolescent boys centers across the nation. Mm-hmm. And the, I think the closest one to us is Sparks, Nevada. Okay. It's part of the Pacific, or uh, the south, the southwest Nevada. I don't. I can't remember the name, but. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also a summer program. Um, New Haven. Yes. Yes, yeah. that's for young children in general, boys or girls. Mm-hmm. And okay. It's faith based. Mm-hmm. Here, but a little closer. Can yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where that's. Oh, for some reason I cannot remember. It's between here and Phoenix somewhere. Oh my goodness, sure. caught me off guard. But yeah, there's New Haven for for both that are underage as well. Mm-hmm. So if you're a parent listening to the show at this moment and you are thinking this sounds like something you might want to try or learn a lot more about, we'll just go to your website and find information or call. Well, you can start with tcaz.org. It stands for Teen Challenge Arizona. And it's a nice, and, short, easy one. Yeah, tcaz.org, <laughs> and that's that. That'll be a start. There's we've got volunteer information there. We've got information on donating. We've got information on, well, basically everything. All of our centers, all of our programs. So um, there's in, in, information on on um, intakes on how to contact our intake departments. Okay. In each of the centers, um, and that's that's a start. But uh, Teen Challenge USA has a website where the adolescent boy and girl centers are. Okay. Um, so that would be a place you could go to. And if, even if you type in adolescent teens or adolescent boys center, they'll probably come up. Teen Challenge will come up on that. Sure. High I've, on the list, I and imagine. I've, and I've, yeah, I've, I've made a lot of referrals to the Sparks, Nevada facility. So um, there's, um, and there's a need. Sure. There's a, right now there's a crisis out here, especially... In Arizona, it's it's uh, fentanyl, yes, oh, and it's in everything, and it is an animal that uh, it's just it's getting more ferocious by the day. And children so. are finding drugs mm. earlier and younger it's, than ever before, and they are like you were saying earlier. It's not when decades ago when the the drug of choice for young people was marijuana. Now they are very very scary things. Yeah. So. We so appreciate you being on the show and having so many wonderful things to say and such a great uh, opportunity for people to move forward. So I really thank all that Teen Challenge does and both of you. And did you have one other thing you wanted to talk about? I wanted to tell you what our next... We want to make sure we get that in. Thank you. I wanted to tell you what our next event is. Yes. Um, It is the the Tucson Men's Center and the Springboard Mm -hmm. um, Home for Girls actually coordinate together. So Mm -hmm. Patty and I are a team. On this, it's the annual Bug Splat motorcycle run. Bug Splat, what a name. And, yeah, right, yeah. And classic car show. Okay. Patty's taking care of the cars. I'm taking care of the motorcycle run. And uh, it's on Saturday, September 9th at Christian Faith Fellowship, 1900 North Country Club Road here in Tucson. And if I can tell you what the deal is here. Yes, um, you bet. We have um, a number of motorcycle groups that are going to be supporting this. So we've got seven sponsors right now. But this is open to the public. We serve food. Mm-hmm. We have uh, the car show. Um, the festivities begin at around... 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, mm-hmm. yes. The motorcycles, if you want to register, if you're a motorcycle rider or you want to ride as a couple, come and see us. Our registration starts at 8 a.m. Um, 
the kickstands up at nine o'clock. Yep. Uh, you'll be going through the Southern Arizona Scenic Tour. Oh, okay. so there's a couple places they they call it Gates Pass, and I think is the main route, and that's uh, through Picture Rock. So it's going to be a beautiful. On that now. And the car ride. show um, registration starts at 10. 10. So whoever has a car they want to show off, it doesn't have to be a classic one. Um, you can bring anything you want to show off. And we have raffle items. That's right. But we also have trophies. That's right. So oh, we've, very fun. So we're going to be judging the bikes and the, uh, mm-hmm. and the cars. And mm-hmm. so there are going to be multiple trophies. There's also going to be um, a raffle prizes in yes. addition to this. Yeah. So there'll be gift cards and uh, restaurant uh Stuff from like Texas Roadhouse, in fact, mm-hmm. one of our sponsors. Oh, very nice. And so them. you'll, um, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're expecting a couple hundred people, but we'd love to. Well, the more, the merrier. Yeah. And it sounds like it's so, a good family so event. It is. People it of is. all ages. Absolutely. And this is something that we do annually. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So this is just one of many of our events. Mm-hmm. Like Patty said before, um, we have a fall banquet. That's our biggest fundraiser, and so. Um, I hope uh, you can just go to our website. Actually, mm-hmm. anybody can go to the website. This event will be on there as well as any of our upcoming events. And if you miss so. it this year, for whatever reason, you'll know to come back next year. Absolutely. That's Always right. a good fall event in That's Tucson. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully our listeners will reach out to you, whether they want to volunteer, sponsor, come to one of those many fun events. And again, thank you so much for all you do for our community. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Appreciate You're very it very welcome. much. Mm-hmm.